2022 Virtual College Fed Challenge competition. First, we're going to read your team ID. Please confirm that this is the team ID you have, students and judges. 2022-002-00332. Is that correct? Yes. Great, thank you. All right, um, advisors and spectators, please mute and do not show yourself on video. I believe we're already doing that. Team, are all your presenters present and ready to go? Yes. Great. Please, I don't see this as the case, but I'm just going to say it. Um, please do not have any school identifiers in your WebEx or your um, presentation today. A few rules before we get started. If you are not presenting, please mute your lines and do not show video. When you are not speaking, it's a good idea to mute so sound is clear. We are going to be recording today's session for final judging. You may have your slides up that were used during your presentations submitted in October. You could not have updated the data within. The economy is essentially locked in when you submitted that video. If you verbally reference updated data, it will not help your team or hurt a team's score that does not do the same. In a few minutes, we're going to start a timer. Dean will state two minutes and end verbally. This may interrupt your sentence, but please allow it. Jose, can you verify where you're recording? You're on mute, Jose. You. Sorry about that. Nope. Uh, recording is confirmed. Great, thank you. Judges, can you verify that you have the two common questions? Yes. yes. Great. Um, and can you please introduce yourselves quickly, judges? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Bohan, uh, Bohan Wong. I work in the Division of Financial Stability. And hi, I'm Sam Dro. I'm also in the Division of Financial Stability. Great, thank you. And thank you again for your time. If we're ready to get started, we will start the timer when the first question gets asked. Everyone ready? Great. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Uh, our first question is, explain your view about the future trajectory of labor force participation. What are the implications of this view for your assessment of appropriate monetary policy? So I'd just like to start off by saying that the labor market is unprecedentedly tight at the moment. Um, we've seen U3 numbers uh, and U3 and U6 numbers at 3.7 and 6.8% respectively in the most recent reports and sort of before that in, in the September reports at 3.5 and 6.7%. We've seen an imbalance between supply and demand, specifically on the demand side. We've seen non-farm payrolls gaining 261,000 in the most recent report. Um, that's up from three, that's down from 315,000 in September. Um, so this is a slowing rate, but still positive and came in above expectations. On the supply side, we've seen uh, a huge glut in supply. On the LFPR front, we see that's down 1.2% from the pre-pandemic levels, driven primarily by long-term trends that have been accelerated by COVID. That uh, includes early retirements, uh, as well as sort of trends, broader trends uh, among prime age men, and as well as long COVID, which has resulted in 15% of unfilled jobs. Lastly, we also see a decrease in immigration and foreign workers, which sort of uh, additionally hits uh, this labor supply. We also see within prime age LFPR, we've seen a near full recovery um, that has driven sort of some of the partial recovery in F LFPR um, at 82.5%. Kind of to touch upon my colleague's points regarding um, the decrease in LFPR over recent months um, in the COVID era recovery. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is the fact that the vacancy to unemployment ratio still remains extremely elevated, hovering around 1.7 to 1.8 uh, per per worker. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out that is very important to the Fed is the fact that the vacancy to unemployment ratio does lead to um, an un elevated vacancy on un to unemployment ratio does lead to increased uh, worker bargaining power for, for their salaries and wages. Um, and although it's not uh, necessarily one of the largest contributing factors to inflation, uh, we still would like to keep in mind the fact that wage inflation is a sentient uh, aspect of, of inflation. So just to address some of the monetary policy implications of LFPR and the overall labor market dynamics, as we know, um, monetary policy tools are aimed at addressing demand and not necessarily the supply side drivers. However, there is 
for, uh, first off, significant room for demand to cool. And um, in addition, given these supply side constraints, that means that monetary policy tools would have to um, act pretty aggressively at the moment in order to restore that demand to really better align with the with supply. So as we monitor some of the near term as well as long term uh, pressures on the supply side from pandemic era disruptions, as well as this broader demographic shift, it's really important to rethink about how to conduct monetary policy, given the constraints on the supply side and restore um, those balances in the economy. Thank you, Oz. The next question. Um, the current uh, cycle of monetary policy tightening is taking place in an environment where real estate prices are extraordinarily high. Um, does this suggest to you that monetary policy tightening is likely to have an outsized effect on this sector and through it a larger than usual effect on the economy? If so, how should monetary policymakers take this into consideration? Yeah, it's certainly very important to consider the path of monetary policy trans uh, transmission throughout the economy when you're considering these sectoral impacts of monetary policy. Uh, for example, in response to the rate hikes that we've already seen thus far, we saw that the Q3 numbers for residential fixed investment uh, fell, fell by 26% in Q3. So you are seeing that these interest rate sensitive spending uh, sectors are certainly responding uh, not only quickly to our rate hikes, but uh, in a very strong way. Um, so, in some ways, yes, you do see this strong response that you're, you're talking about, but it's also important to note that this is the kind of response we'd like to see, uh, given that inflation is uh, considerably high right now. We also have returned to positive growth and we're seeing a very tight labor market. This is uh, overall indicative that uh, the, these changes in the interest rate sensitive sectors will kind of spread out to the rest of the real economy and uh, hopefully these tightening financial conditions will, will contribute to a slowdown in inflation uh, and a, a, a slight cooling of what some might call an overly tight labor market. i just like to reiterate my colleague's point about the path of monetary policy transmission of where we first hit uh, financial conditions, financial conditions tighten, which then affects the real economy, which then affects inflation. And so um, given how tight monetary policy has been we've see, uh, we've seen financial conditions react accordingly especially in these very interest rate sensitive sectors such as residential and business uh, business fixed investments um, and so that's natural given our policy and that is what we expect um, on the on the side of our, is housing a current concern to our policy um, I would say not necessarily that uh, I don't think that we we face the risk of overshooting or being too tight, given how healthy balance sheets are. Uh, we see like low credit risk, low delinquency risk. So even though housing prices um, are on the rise, um, it is important that we continue with this aggressive policy in order to align, uh, in order to keep up with our commitment to align demand with supply and bring overall inflation down. And just to reiterate my colleagues' points on the importance of the housing market, um, it is definitely important from a financial stability point of view, as well as the overall inflation stories. Um, and that's because households spend a very sizable portion of their budget on housing in general. It contributes uh, to a significant portion of core PCE specifically. Um, and so far, we've seen this surge in housing prices given the surge in demand during um, the economy's recovery from COVID, as well as supply side constraints. We're now seeing some of this demand cooling as well as supply, uh, as well as supply increasing. So creating some of that excess inventory, but housing prices will likely not um, slow down in the coming month, given how sticky they are. Some of the rents locked in um, will not be able to be revised. And that's a part of um, what Governor Waller has mentioned uh, earlier last month when he talked about the economic outlook uh, with respect to the housing market. So while we will continue to monitor some of the trends in the housing market, it's really important to acknowledge that our commitment to fighting inflation right now and, 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 in, and in addressing uh, that part of our dual mandate um, it, it is, is a core focus of monetary policy. And we will also continue to monitor um, the stability risks as, as we conduct this risk uh, management based framework. Okay, uh, 
I'll ask the next question. Um, what sort of coordination between the Federal Reserve System and other international central banks is necessary and prudent given uh, current economic conditions? Well, one of the things that I'd like to point out is the fact that uh, the Fed's uh, dual mandate does not explicitly entail that it uh, leads to coordination with international, other international central banks. Um, however, obviously, the Fed's policy making does, of course, have several implications, not only on other central bankers uh, decision making, but also on international currency exchange rates, as well as um, interest rates worldwide. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to point out um, is the fact that uh, U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve interest rates rate hikes do, of course, uh, affect other uh, central banks tightening cycles as well. I'd also just like to add that currently we've seen the effect of our uh, of our policy uh, has strengthened the dollar. Um, and that is important in the context of the global economy because the dollar is used as the foreign uh, is as used as the re global reserve currency. Um, and all of this policy has been done in order to bring US inflation uh, down, um, which will have broader benefits. However, it is important to note that there are a lot of uh, foreign, uh, there are a lot of foreign countries that have debt in uh, US do dollars. Um, so, for example, a lot of Latin American countries. Um, so, as we uh, tighten our policy, it is important to consider the risk of uh, Latin uh, Latin American economies defaulting on their on their on their um, loans the way that we saw during like the Volcker era. So that is something to consider as we engage in this policy. Yes, definitely. And, and lastly, just to round us out, uh, overall, we see global central banks engaging in this tightening cycle, and that's going to amplify the tightening that uh, the Federal Reserve is pursuing in the U.S. by damping foreign demand for U.S. goods, um, and as, as well as overall tightening financial conditions. And as my colleagues have mentioned, um, the U.S. is definitely interconnected with um, international economies in every front, and there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, both in terms of the financial and economic systems, but also the geopolitical landscape. So it's really important to consider how this is driving um, supply and demand at home, as well as uh, putting it in, in context of financial stability. Um, as we have seen in past episodes, we've definitely um, had both regional as well as global um, financial contagion, contagion effects that, that have had a real effect on the economy. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, so kind of, you've mentioned this a couple of times, but more explicitly, can you explain what is the relationship between monetary policy and financial stability? And are there any financial stability concerns that you find particularly salient at the moment? Um, as my colleagues have mentioned before, uh, monetary policy has a strict uh, a strict effect on specifically interest rate sensitive spending, um, which directly translates into financial markets. Uh, right now, we still do see uh, relatively um, stable financial markets um, as well as stable balance sheets. Um, so that shouldn't necessarily be a huge concern for the Fed. Um, currently, and we believe that the Fed should stick to its guns in uh, continuing an aggressive policy response. I'd also just like to add to that how one of the roles of uh, the one of the roles of the Fed is to be a supervisor for financial institutions. So part of that includes being a lender of the last resort. Um, during the COVID era pandemic, we saw how um, we saw how they were, they created all these Section 133 lending facilities in order to backstop liquidity in markets and to pro make sure that there was still financial stability. Um, and this is really important. Um, this is really important because of historical precedents. We've seen how uh, in 2008, when there was uh, with the mortgage uh, with mortgage backed securities and all of that subprime lending, how um, how a weak financial 
weak financial markets uh, then translated into the real economy and had that that risk there. Um, so e that was definitely very true back then and is like is reason for monetary policy to be concerned about financial stability. Also in the case of the efficacy of monetary policy transmission um, and turning to some risks right now, uh, I don't believe that we really see many financial stability risks. Um, household, as mentioned before, household balance sheets and um, business balance sheets are quite healthy. That is a consequence two minutes. of two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a consequence of the pandemic era um, and how uh, and that's a consequence of the pandemic. I completely agree with my colleagues. Um, and I think that though there's nothing that's um, very major in our minds at the moment. One thing that is beginning to peak over the horizon is sort of the illiquidity in the longer term treasuries um, as a result of the Fed sort of um, large scale quantitative easing over the past um, or, or the, over the past decade or so. It's resulted in sort of a huge accumulation of securities and as they begin to um, off uh, as they begin to um, tighten quantitatively, um, it has resulted in sort of this trend that some traders are beginning to see. And just to bring it home, um, right now we see in the November financial stability report, participants citing persistent inflation and higher than expected uh, monetary policy tightening as the biggest risk, which means that in order for um, these macro potential risks to stay low, it's really important that the Fed remains committed to fighting inflation. And that is what monetary policy tools are designed for. So as we continue to monitor these other risks, for example, associated with balance sheets, with credit quality, et cetera, it's also really important for the Fed to continue to deliver data dependent um, and conditional forward guidance to be really clear um, in, in communicating its policy path and, and to, uh, to pursue appropriate policy in order to bring inflation down. Powell also noted that, uh, you know, we need, he wants to see positive real interest rates across the yield curve before we really considering, um, you know, stopping, stopping tightening. And so this is important to note that we still don't see positive real interest rates across the yield curve. So that means that while financial conditions are tightening, uh, they certainly could not be considered anything near like that you know, extraordinarily tight yet. We also see that uh, consumer credit delinquency rates are still at 1.7%, which time's is very up. low. Sorry, time's up. Thank you, Jean. Sorry, guys, for the interruption. <laughs> um, thank you again for your time today and your participation in this year's Virtual College Fed Challenge. You will receive an invitation to the winner announcement that's going to take place on November 18th at 2.30 p.m. We're going to have programming from 2.30 to 3, and then we'll deliver the winning teams after that. A press release will also announce the winners that day. The winning video presentation and Q&A sessions will be uploaded to the board's website after the announcement. After that time, we will also be in touch about supplying your video Q&A sessions. On behalf of the board economic education team, thank you for competing in the Virtual College Fed Challenge. Have a great remainder of your school year and holiday season. And again, judges, thank you for your time. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you.